Hi, welcome to Kelly Talks. My name is Kelly Lorraine, and I'm here to talk about all things spirituality. Today, I'm so blessed to have Becca with me. Becca is not only a member of my community online, but she is one of my best friends. Becca, welcome. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you for inviting me on this. I'm really excited and honored to be here so thank you you're welcome I'm so happy to do this Becca there's so many things that I know that we could talk about we've known each other actually for quite a while I don't even know how far this goes back um, in my TikTok days or my Instagram days but it just seems like you've been a part of my online family for so long and that's the beauty of connection you know online I mean we live on different continents and we're just part of this online family and friend group and it's been amazing. So Becca, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I'm Becca, I'm 40. I live in London in the UK. I work in HR and I'm single. And those are kind of my labels, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, who I am as a person or as a soul, I like to call it now, I, I've been on a journey over the past seven, eight years. Uh, my mum passed away and that started me down a journey of grief and mental ill health. And through that process, I have wanted to learn more about myself. And I started off looking into my own natal chart which was great because I could learn more about myself, understand myself a lot more. Mm -hmm. And then I started to think about, okay, well, this tells me who I am. How do I make practical plans to change how my right. life is? Which is how I kind of fell into looking at human design. And mm -hmm. I've even done a few videos on human design. Um, and I've been part of your family, Kelly, for... Oh, over a year and a half now, I think. Yeah, I think so. Not long. Um, and we've had one-to-ones together. I've participated in the Passion Project, and you have been such a helpful, oh, thank you, inspiring guide and support for me along this journey of who I am right now. I appreciate that so much, Becca. It has been such a pleasure. I think one of the things that I love most about what I do is that I get to talk to people from all over the world and be a part of their journey or their story. And I get to watch the progress. It's basically the teacher in me. You know, I'm not in a contained classroom. I'm in this digital world of learning and teaching is still so a part of me. And you allow me to do that. And I, I appreciate that so much. It's so much more than just, you know, teaching its connections that's what means the most to me and I think that you know your getting to know your astrology has been really really integral to your growth I mean that's sort of the starting mm -hmm. point and I remember when we first started talking and we went through your astrology and by the way you know that's the first question that I will ask anybody you know what their astrology is so you're going to tell us in a second but I have to tell everybody one fun fact and that is that Becca and I have the same birthday now we're not born the same year I have a couple of years on her but we are September 12th Virgo twins and mm -hmm. it's funny to me because I had never really met many people with my birthday but I just learned recently actually that we have a common birthday which completely surprises me but I digress. Uh, we are Virgo twins, but ultimately you have your, your different moon and rising sign. Please share with us so that we know. So I am your birthday twin, which is such a lovely coincidence. Yeah, um, yeah. But I am a Cancer rising mm -hmm. and I have a Scorpio moon. And I remember us talking about that. Anybody that I know with a Scorpio moon, and if any of you out there have a Scorpio moon, you know that that's not an easy placement. That is uh, a placement that makes us feel misunderstood. You know, the Scorpio nature is very intense. It's very deep. It wants to connect, but at times doesn't always know how to because they feel so deeply. And so I always found, uh, especially in my teaching career, that there were a lot of people uh, around me that felt misunderstood, whether that was by their parents, by their teachers, by their friends, and they didn't really know where they fit. 
And I could always sort of tell a Scorpio moon once I want, and especially once I knew they were a Scorpio moon that made it even more clear. And there's nothing wrong with having a difficult placement. I think what it is because no chart is perfect. We all have our, our positives and not so positives in our charts. I can think of a few in mind, but it's how we actually, you know, grow with them and learn to understand ourselves. So, I mean, that kind of takes me to a question for you about how do you define your energy? I can define my energy in one of two ways. And I guess I could think about it in a my Virgo type of way, my masculine mm -hmm. energy. And mm -hmm. I could think about it in my Scorpio moon feminine energy. Mm -hmm. So the way I used to describe my energy, if I even knew how to describe what my own energy was before this mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. um, I would have said my energy is very organized. It's very Virgo like. Mm -hmm. I'm a organized chaos, is probably... that would be. The book. <laughs> <laughs> I just said to Rebecca earlier, I could care less if my clothes are in the dryer for a week or on the floor, but when I'm presenting something, I'm very particular. Like that has to be absolutely aligned in a way that I, that I, that I like. Absolutely. <laughs> so I have great organization skills. I'm very much attention to detail. I'm very logical. I'm very process driven. And that was how my energy always was before of problem solving, not just for myself, but for other people as well. Mm -hmm. And trying to help and over give previously so I'm aware of my masculine energy is very logical it's very thought based mm -hmm. and I appreciate that side of me when I need to use that for myself right the other side of my energy is my feminine energy of my Scorpio moon and as you quite rightly said Kelly it's a difficult placement I have felt misunderstood all of my life aside from mm. maybe the last year or two and I now see it as such a gift to have a yes. Scorpio thing because mm -hmm. I'm so in touch with my emotions that I am able to be in a room with people and just feel their emotions without having to speak to them be anywhere near them I can just feel it it's that Scorpio intuition Mm -hmm. And I can feel their emotions. And because I'm very much aware of my own emotions and the gravity of them, I now don't force any interactions with people because I'm aware that sometimes people aren't very comfortable with their emotions. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite happy to start back. And I don't take it personally anymore. If somebody doesn't want to talk to me, be near me, that's, I understand. I have but compassion you know, for you. I love. Not to interrupt you though. I, I I just want to put in this one point. To me, I think the best friendships are the type where you can just pick up wherever you left off. Like there's no pressure. Meaning, if I speak to you, I speak to you. If I don't, it's okay too. Life does get in the way, and I think there's a lot of understanding that needs to take place there. You know, so I'm kind of a no pressure zone friend. Where really, if somebody said hey, listen, I can't make it tonight, even at the last second, I'm okay with that. I mean, granted, that is a little bit of a Virgo in me that doesn't mind being a hermit and staying home. But at the mm -hmm. same time, but at the same time, I'm really okay with it. It wouldn't anger me if somebody said, hey, listen, I can't make it or I don't have the capacity or whatever it is. I think that those type of friendships are integral to our growth because when people take things personally or when it becomes a back and forth, it complicates things. Mm -hmm. And I very much have had those types of friendships in my life where I perhaps don't talk to a friend for two, mm -hmm. three, four months. Then we speak, we catch up and it's like nothing's ever changed. Mm -hmm. And now I fully understand why I'm so comfortable with that. Um, and my my energy, my feminine energy, like my cancer rising, I'm very loving I'm very compassionate I'm very mm -hmm. I want to help people and yes. I 
I have so much love to give that before I used to give it all out to everyone first. Right. right. But now I fill my own cup up first and the rest just naturally overflows and flows out to everyone else in the most beautiful way. I love that. You know, I think one of the most difficult things for anybody is the overgiving. I say it every day, overgiving, overdoing, problem solving. And, you know, just looking at your placements, I'll put it to you this way. Your top three are very overgiving placements. Now, don't get me wrong. All signs really have that, but in different capacities. It's just like every sign overthinks just in different <laughs> ways. You know what I mean? I think that's why we're all unique based on our charts. But you know, your Virgo-ness is acts of service. Those are things where like you want to do things for people. And I'm the same way as a Virgo. Your mm -hmm. Scorpio moon is very intense and Scorpio energy holds on very tightly. You know, once they let go, they let go. Don't get me wrong. When they shut that door, yes. they shut that door. There's, there's almost no coming back from that. Um, although mm -hmm. I do debate that. And that's another talk one day about how I don't think Scorpios always have to shut that door, but I do understand it. You know, you want to give, give, give till the very end to the, very, especially Scorpio women, they will give to the very end until they absolutely cannot anymore. And then they, they shut that door, you know, they, 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 they cut it out. Um, but because they love so hard, they really hold on tight and the cancer rising cancer placements, in my opinion, uh, really do struggle with the overgiving because cancer is ruled by the moon. And if the moon is divine feminine energy, right? The idea is that we should be nurturing and be intuitive. Like I always talk about the idea of gardening. You know, I always say you can't go bust out the miracle grow and try to make the garden grow quicker. You know, the flowers bloom tomorrow or the apples or the fruit on the tree. Um, it just doesn't happen that way. It's just that cancers have a tough time distinguishing between the giving and the nurturing. Because oftentimes people think of it as the same thing and it's not really the same thing because giving is masculine energy. It's providing, mm -hmm. it's problem solving, it's taking action and that's not a bad thing. We can have that balance in our, in our lives. We talk about this all the time, equal giving and receiving and balance, but it's almost like cancers want to overdo it like to the point of I'm here for you. I'm going to nurture you. I'm I'm going to take care of you in every possible way. But then they put themselves last. And I'm kind of wondering if that's sort of the, the mother archetype, you know, of the fact that, you know, mothers tend to um, be seen as uh, giving everything, you know, mm -hmm. being everything to everyone. And that's something that I think a lot of people naturally uh, struggle with. So, you know, in your placements, you've had to really figure out how to balance that overgiving and that desire to be loved because that's such a natural thing. Of course we want to be loved and that's why we give. But I've seen such a shift in you, Becca. It's, it's unbelievable. And again, when I get to meet people, I build friendships, I build bonds. You know, our friendship is unique to us just like my friendships in other sessions that I do. I learned so much about people and the importance of spiritual friendships. How has that been important to you in the last while, maybe versus earlier in life? What difference has it made for you? It has made the biggest difference to my life. And I recently went on a mind, body and soul retreat. And mm -hmm. as part of this retreat, we did a a hypnotic meditation and I went back and met my my younger version of myself mm -hmm. and I had a conversation and the conversation the younger version of me was upset and I was like why are you crying she said no one loves me the way that I love me and nobody understands me and for me that's where like a penny dropped I was like but I love me mm -hmm. as much as I love me I understand me it all is within me and I was like wow that's that's such a key part of me coming to this big acceptance of myself and whilst I was at the retreat I have made friends with people that I'm still in touch with now and being able to be in a place with people who are like-minded mm -hmm. who are open to spirit who are open to energy who are open to conversations just even open-minded in general for me 
makes me feel so seen and so understood. Even now I'm feeling a little bit emotional about it because it Mm -hmm. means so much to me to feel understood and to be in an environment where I can freely just be myself and ask questions and have Mm -hmm. conversations without people maybe looking at me slightly differently or being oh woo woo no oh I know feelings as well I've been there I mean not to interrupt you but you know I go back to the times when I was segueing you know out of my teaching career into what I'm doing currently and I remember when I first got into cards you know tarot cards oracle cards and I would hide them I would hide them I'd put them in a crate and cover them up with placemats because I didn't want my friends to see because I wasn't ready to show that part of me or that side of me because sadly you know there are going to be people that judge or that don't understand and this is the whole thing about friendships unfortunately not everybody's going to be on the journey with us they will be with us for a season and a reason and that's okay too But I do think that meeting people who are like-minded make the world a difference. You know, I can think of two specific friends that really helped me along the way. And the first one was right during my reawakening. I remember when I had the Kundalini shakes, if anybody's ever had the Kundalini awakening where it feels like your whole body is like shaking and tingling, it's your chakra is like on fire. And she was there with me. And like witnessed me in that moment where I'm like, I just couldn't stop shaking. It was almost like I had the chills, you know, and she was open-minded enough to listen and talk to me for hours upon hours about what I was going through. And it, it made me feel more secure because sometimes I think on the spiritual journey, you do feel alone or you feel like nobody would understand or believe you, you know, the things that you're seeing, that you're feeling, that you're experiencing. And she was there for me. And when I shifted into another phase of my awakening, actually, when I moved away, she was my neighbor. She was my next door neighbor. I was so blessed to have somebody literally right next door to me to come sit with me and have coffee in my garage and and just enjoy each other's company. But, you know, at this home, I was so lucky that a couple doors down was a new friend who understood the things that I was going through or was interested in the same things. And again, made the world of difference. Now, sadly, along the way, yes, there were other people in my life that understood what I was going through or partially understood or didn't at all. And we lost contact or we just fizzled out. It was not like anything bad happened. It's just, you know, Mm -hmm. things shifted. And so I think this is actually a really important topic that we don't talk about enough because we need a support system. And I think that when I started my TikTok, my Instagram, my YouTube, my goal was to have a setting or a place where people could feel comfortable. I don't want to say it's like cheers where everybody knows your name, but it's the idea that people can come together and laugh and cry and be serious and talk about things that normally we can't talk about with other people. And I can't get over how it developed into a daily ritual of coming together all over the world different walks of life different experiences different timelines as in we're not all at the same point and we can't be because we're all unique to our spiritual journey but there's just something universal about being a human being I think we forget about that that the human condition makes everything universal and that there is something in it for everyone regardless of what stage you're at in this journey and the support system. I've never seen such support like this. I usually have two screens going Instagram and TikTok, and it's almost like we're one family, even though we might be on different platforms, there's a connection there. um, That is really fun. And I'm so blessed Becca that, you know, you've made friends through that, you know, we've made friends with each other. Um, It's been an absolute joy. And I just know that this is why, friendships mean so much it's not just love relationships I think everybody looks at relationships as like has to be like romantic or like how they shift us it's not just romantic relationships it's it's friendship absolutely and I even in your lives I've made best friends for life and I'm even going to see one later this year in That's the amazing. States. so I, I, love I, I am so thankful for your channel and thank you for your lives because 
I've made a best friend in you and I've made best friends with others and it really is such a safe space to be able to ask questions and talk about things that maybe others aren't comfortable talking about. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, this actually leads me to another question, Becca, because I did mention a moment ago romantic relationships. You know, I think what we have to remember about the spiritual journey is that it's actually such a combination of friendship, romantic relationships, family dynamics. You know, as a side note, in your own family, astrologically, it's fascinating to me, the Scorpio element in your family, the Taurus element, the axis, you know, something that people don't always recognize is, I know we're more than our sun signs, you know, forgive me, it's not just the sun sign, absolutely, from an astrological perspective. But when I'm talking to people, and they're telling me about the things that they're going through in their life, I'll somehow go and map the family dynamic. And I don't know where I get this gift from. I've had it my whole life where I can just go, boop, 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 boop. it's like a computer going. And I'll say, well, what's the zodiac sign of your mother or your father or this, that, whatever. And then we end up in a conversation of how we're choosing partners who are similar, you know, to our parents, even the same zodiac signs, or even like we have placements, you know, Scorpio moon, Scorpio mom, or, oh, your dad's mm -hmm. a Taurus. Oh, okay. So we have the axis there. So you're looking at this, you're looking at that. And it always fascinates me how it all sort of like comes full circle and why we choose the people we choose or the relationships we choose, whatever. Um, it's all encompassing. It's not just one thing. So, you know, Becca, one of the things that I really am so proud of you for is your ability to be self-aware and to make moves. Like I've seen you make so many amazing moves in this period of time, especially when it comes to putting yourself out there in relationships as in dating. And that's where I was going with this a moment ago, but I got sidetracked a little bit with family and stuff because I wanted to point that out too. It's all part of the, the bigger picture, right? It's not just one, one um, facet, even career too. That's another part. Um, but you've been putting yourself out there. How has your awareness of, let's say, the masculine and feminine energy that we always talk about, how has that changed your view on dating? It has really helped. I think what's helped me was we had a conversation, Kelly, Mm -hmm. and I'd already done a passion project on human design and you said why not do a passion project on dating and I mm -hmm. was like that's <laughs> a great idea because then I'll know exactly what I want exactly what I'm looking for and if I want x y and z I know I have to be x y and z so I know mm -hmm. what I need to work on right and I have as you said, been putting myself in new energy. And I feel like this year as a whole, I have been putting myself in new energy and doing things that before I would have said, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Now, now I am putting myself forward. I'm willing new energy to come in. I'm very open for it. So in terms of dating, <laughs> I remember we had a conversation, Kelly, mm -hmm. and I put up, a profile on a dating website and I sent you my pictures and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I made sure that any descriptive writing was in feminine tones and my yeah. pictures were of a feminine nature and I remember I put my profile up and I think it was the exact day that I put my profile up I was just walking to the shop and I was returning a parcel and a guy stopped me and said you know hey can I talk to you can I take mm -hmm. your number can I give you a call and I was like okay I have nothing to lose right and because I was already in that new energy I was like normally I would have said oh no I'm not sure but I automatically just said yes right and I put myself out there and I was speaking to this guy and I started to listen to my intuition of mm -hmm. uh, 
things maybe not being as they seemed. And I was actually listening to what he said. And at one point he said to me, uh, I am at peace being on my own. I'm not keen. Like I'm not actively looking right. for a relationship right now. Right, right. And so for me, I was like, okay, I need to listen to this. He's not right. looking for a relationship right now. So that means what he wants is not what I want. So that's fine. You're not my person. It didn't work out in the end. No problem. Before I would have been like, oh, but I like him and he's really right. cute. Or we try to convince. I've I've been there multiple times myself. I mean, we all have, you know, we want to make something work because we like the person or we see the potential, right? We marry potential, we yeah. divorce reality. The most common, the most common mm -hmm. thing that happens, you know, on the daily with regards to dating. But what I love about what you did, Becca, is that you put yourself out there. Like you said, you actively listened to what he said and you had the control to assess what you wanted, what you didn't want, what you liked, what you didn't like. And you were strong enough to see what happens and even allow yourself to be tested, which is not easy because I know some of the tests that came along with this person uh, were, 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 were not so not so easy. And you handled yourself super, super well, but you were willing to be in that position. And I always say with dating, and I, I get, everybody says how bad the dating world is or this, that, whatever. I really disagree with that. I know that there are people out there that are not great or that the dating world is a lot of situationships or a lot of hot and cold or breadcrumbing and ghosting. I get it. But there are 8 billion people in this world. And I do believe that there are good people out there. And the only way to get better is to be better. You know, in my dating life, it's not that, you know, somebody miraculously just fell from the sky who was amazing. It got better because I just kept putting myself out there and knowing what I like and what I don't like, what I'm willing to accept and not willing to accept. And let me just add something here. And that is whenever somebody tells me there's so many you know, crappy situations out there. I refuse to put myself out there. I, I get it. But let me counteract that for a moment. If we are so self-aware that or, or self-aware and aware about the dating world, then it shouldn't be any difficulty to say, no, thank you. Unmatch, delete and move on to the next. It's not an excuse to not put yourself out there. Because it's very easy to say, well, you know, everybody's everybody's so bad out there. Well, I'm not going to bother trying. And let's be real. A lot of us want the connection. We want love. So in order to find that, we have to go through the motions of getting better, whatever that means for us, healing. And it doesn't have to happen overnight. You can take breaks. I mean, I think that's another thing to mention is that nobody has to be on dating apps 24 seven. It can very well be, Hey, listen, I'm going to be on there for a month or two, and then I'm going to take a break. But I always encourage people to always put yourself out there. But again, you know, I talk about this frequently about perceived openness. I think a lot of people say that they're open. Well, yeah, if this person comes along or if somebody, whatever, but then, you know, when we actually like get into the motions of putting ourselves out there, are we truly open? Because our energy can tell somebody if we're open or not. And what I love about what you just said about your dating profile is that you were mindful of feminine energy. Feminine energy is about how you feel. Like in your profile, writing a descrip description can be things like, I feel exhilarated when. I'm most happy when. If we're listing things like, I like hiking, I like this, I like that, I do this, I do that, those can be very masculine. And it's not about, you know, presenting as a man or presenting as a woman. It's not about gender. It's just the idea of how you put yourself out there in regards to how you feel. Because the, the, the likeliness is that if you put out feminine energy prompts or answers, I guess you could say, it should, in theory, kind of push away any feminine energy 
potential people because that polarity won't mesh. Absolutely. And I feel that now being in the dating world again, I feel like I have so much control and power mm -hmm. over my choices. Right. And it's not so much, do you like me? It's, do I like you? You, yeah, exactly. And it, for me, it feels incredibly empowering to know exactly what I want, to not be afraid of who I am. Like, I'm into planes. Like, I love planes. I've got, like, mm -hmm. a plane tattoo. Yeah. I, yeah. I, on my profile, I've got a picture of me with a plane in aviation. And love it. I'm not afraid to be myself anymore and say, this is me. This is this is who I am. And it's so incredibly empowering to be able to do that and feel like I'm in control and I want to have quality options. So I'm going to focus mm -hmm. on what I like and put in boundaries as and when I need to. Well, I love that you said quality options, because I do say that often, you know, we have to be very careful when we talk about our dating, because I'll give you an example of when I was very young, like very early in my dating days, I used to always say to my friends, oh, you know, like I have options, but I don't have options. And I don't know how many of you ever felt that way, but I have options, but I don't have options, which meant that I really kind of wasn't attracting, you know, what I was looking for. You know, I think in this dating world in general, it's not hard to meet people. You can meet people. The question is, do you meet people that feel like a like a real potential match? You know, it, it's got to be the right fit. And I just decided in my sort of second round of dating, meaning after I was separated and 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 newly dating, I said to myself, I got to get out of this mindset of having options. I know I have options, but I have to change the wording of that to quality options, because if I'm just saying I have options, I get everything, everything and, and, and anything. And I want something that's quality or I have to have in my mind what I'm looking for. And everybody's definition of quality is, is different. You know, you might be looking for somebody who, um, you know, loves to study planes or, you know, has a background somehow in aviation. Maybe that's something for you that mm -hmm. provides quality time, quality discussion. So the word quality is not just about someone's bank account or their, their, mm -hmm. you know, attractiveness. It's not that at all. We're looking for people who, have similar values or interests that are, you know, that are of quality time, conversation, experiences, et cetera. So that's what I mean by quality options. I don't just mean like they have to be this, 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 and this. It's not about expectations. And actually that leads me to something that I didn't anticipate talking about, but I'm going to, because I think that you will understand this as well. And I think people will want to hear this too. You know, whenever I'm on live and we do get into this topic, I say this, be very careful of the expectations in dating, because oftentimes we limit ourselves by doing that. Now, I'm not saying you have to date everybody. You, there are going to be things you like and you don't like that. That's understandable. But think of it like when you're online shopping and you put search parameters on. The more search parameters you put on, like let's say zodiac sign, height, location, mm -hmm you know, this, that, whatever, we can make a list of, of, of parameters, you realize you're going to get fewer, you know, results. So sometimes our, you know, hmm, we, I was going to say our type, you know, I think a lot of people have a type of someone that they like, and they try to recreate it. I talk about it all the time, you know, dating doppelgangers. And I used to do that myself. I used to, oh, you wouldn't believe how many of the same Zodiac signs, same cultural background, same height, same story. I was trying to recreate something. And what I think is important for people to realize is that when you put these parameters on, you really limit yourself from finding people that could be a really great match. And it's just about being truly open. And, and I go back to that perceived openness, you know, yeah, I'm open, but they got to have this, 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 and this. Well, does that mean you're really open because you might be trying to recreate or you're trying to control how the process is going to go. And sometimes and I'm thinking of the romance angel card deck for those, for those people that know it, it's like one of the OG, you know, romance decks, like your soulmate may differ from your usual type. 
And I kind of giggle at that card because it's true. Sometimes somebody can completely surprise you. They're not what you consider your usual type. And you connect on a level that is unbelievable. Like, how do you know that someone or something will not be the best thing that ever happened to you? It's when we're trying to control it that we don't really achieve what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I always think of the search parameters. Oh, absolutely. That resonates with me completely. And for me, when I was doing my mini passion project on dating, love, mm -hmm. etc., I was thinking about what are my absolute non-negotiables. Right. And mm -hmm. I came down to about five. And I said, those are my five things. Anything else than that, I'm very open to it. Right. Um, I'm happy to talk about what my non-negotiables are. Mm -hmm. um, so one is to be emotionally intelligent because yeah. my Scorpio moon, I am very much about emotions. So someone who can be emotionally intelligent is absolute key for me. Someone who is emotionally available yes. as well yes. is a very big point for me. And there's a difference, not to interrupt you, but there's a real difference between emotionally intelligent and emotionally available. And I don't know if people always recognize that because just because somebody's emotionally intelligent doesn't mean that they're available. You know, this is the concept of like a lot of people who can read self-help books or do everything possible to learn about something, but they don't necessarily implement it. And I think that that's, you know, those are two very distinct things. You want somebody who understands the emotional intelligence at the same time has the ability to be available and to implement what they've learned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, someone who has great communication because mm -hmm. I'm a Virgo, my Mercury's in Virgo as well. I'm all about mm -hmm. communication. Um, and I'm trying to remember what my fourth one is, but I do know that one of them now has to be sense of humor because yeah. I I am quite a happy person. I love to laugh and Me make too. jokes. As people may have seen in the live, sometimes I like to make people laugh. So yes. <laughs> um, sense of humor is a big one for me. So even if I just take those four, anything else, so height, what they do for a career, uh, I think probably the one I was forgetting is uh, passion. They need to be passionate right. about passion. something. Yes. Um, whether that be their career, uh, the earth, spirituality, whatever it is, yeah. something. A hobby, something that they have yeah. for themselves. And let me give you the flip side of that. It, the same goes for us. It's attractive when somebody has something of their own, a hobby of their own, a passion of their own, because that means that when you're not together, it's not dependent on what the other person is doing. It means that there's something that you can go to for your own self, as in your growth, your evolution, and they can do that too. And sometimes that might cross over where there are things, of course, you love to do together or learn about together, but it's so important to have something that you're passionate about, you know? And I think that's very attractive. Like there's nothing sexier than somebody who's passionate about something or ambitious about something. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also good that people have their own interests and their own alone time because mm -hmm. I like my own alone time. Me so too. if someone has an interest that's, I don't know, watching football, yes, I I may go every now and again, but that's your thing to go and do and I'll go watch right. planes in the meantime and have sure. my own time. And then we'll reconvene um, and talk about it. You know, you'll tell me what exactly. you did and all vice versa. Um exactly. But I and wanted to I ask feel, oh, yeah. No, that's okay. I was just oh. gonna say that's those are like my five non negotiables. Anything other than that I'm very open to. So whatever they choose to do in life, however they are, I'm very open. Height used to be a big thing for me because I'm five foot eight, so I always mm -hmm. wanted a tall guy, but the best relationship I had was a guy who was shorter than me. So right. Yes. You know, your soulmate or 
you know, someone who's really good for you isn't always the person that you expect them to be. No, it's so true. And what I was just about to say was that I think it's important to define kind of what a passion project is because we've mentioned it a few times and I, I just want to give people the basics of what a passion project is. Now, I used to do them in my classroom all the time. And what it's based on is, let's say, Google 20. And I don't know if anybody has heard of Google 20. It's the fact that Google would give 20% of the time to an employee to work on something that was important to them or they wanted to discover or learn. And this is how we got things like Google Classroom and Google this and Google that, you know, the development of different facets of the company. And so as a teacher, I would give one day a week to my students every Friday. I thought Friday was actually the best day, Passion Project Friday, um, to come in and work on something related to the class, but not about the class. So for example, I was lucky as an English teacher or even as a French teacher because it was language. So that meant that you would be using reading, writing, communication. You could study anything you wanted. I had students that were doing things like makeup tutorials, teaching soccer tips, building websites, uh, building computers, you name it. It didn't matter what it was because they still had to write about it and communicate. So I would give one day a week to work on a passion project. And then throughout this process, they would communicate with me what stage they're at, the questions they're, they're, they're asking, any obstacles they had. And then eventually they would make a final product, which could have been a website, a video, a presentation or whatever. So I took this concept and I applied it to sort of like you know, our sort of spiritual community or online family where I said, let's work on a passion project, you know, and let's go through the motions. So what are the stages? One is we have to generate some ideas. You know, what are some things that you are passionate about, but you never really got to explore? What's something that you'd love to do, but you stopped doing because life got in the way or something you always wanted to do, but didn't do because life got in the way. And you generate a list of things. And then once you've decided on one thing, and this is the hardest part for people is actually deciding what to do. Think of the metaphor of life. <laughs> How hard is it for people on the daily to make a decision? I want this. It's very hard because we're afraid of making a mistake. We're afraid we're going to be wrong. We're going to be judged or whatever. And I used to have students say to me, well, what if they're doing the same passion project that I am? You're you, they're them. Don't worry. That's, that's, the, that's the beauty of this world. We're all unique, right? So we choose something we ask questions what do we need to know about it so I always say if somebody was starting a photography business you know it's like well what do I need to know what cameras do I need to use what type of lenses what type of shots um, how would I how would I transport my my items what computer software would I need what apps would I need all the things that go into having that business and then you generate your data, you go through it, you compile something, and then you make your final product, which would be like maybe a website or a business or whatever it is. And what Becca did was she took the idea of human design. She asked a bunch of questions about it, learned, compiled. And then in the end, it was, you know what, I want to do some human design readings. And she did one for me. She's done one for her friends or for her family. And so this was a way to generate new learning and that's why i would say sparking sparking is not just about you know a relationship that sparks you or a situation that sparks you it's how you generate new things in your life so new ideas new information it's the synopsis of the brain it's the learning in the brain that gives us new things to experience and then grow that's the growth mindset i was talking about um, in another interview and so becca and i talked about this in regards to dating why not do a passion project in dating? So sorry for the long explanation, but you know, here's Becca saying, okay, what are my non-negotiables? This is my passion project. Let's look at my dating life. Okay, what questions do I need to ask about my dating life? And then it's like, now here's the fun part or not so fun depending on the person or, or perspective. It's uh, how do we compile the data of the dating life? Well. Becca, tell me, how did you compile or how are you compiling data in your dating life? I'm being open to conversations of people out and about. I have been on 
I started on one dating website and I joined another one this week and I'm just very much I'm participating but I'm I'm kind of sitting back and I'm looking at the energy I'm looking at the responses and I'm taking my time with it and I'm not rushing anything and already I can see the patterns of I can see that we're not a match or this is a great conversation you know somebody asked me about why I loved aviation and I was like Mm -hmm. wow that was fantastic and I am just learning and just participating and being very open at the moment to Um, compile my data if you like and I know yeah your your data exactly as in uh, no no pun intended but I would say that this is an experience that is fulfilling and it's fun at times, but it is going to be difficult too. And I want everybody to realize that, you know, what we're saying here is not that it's all rainbows and butterflies. You are going to encounter situations that are going to test you or that are going to be hard. Nobody said that this was easy. It's not necessarily going to be easy. I don't think anything is ever meant to be easy. I mean, the spiritual journey itself is not easy. Life is not easy. It's, it's going to be hard, but to me, it's all about perspective, you know, and what we're looking to achieve. You know, nobody has to change anything overnight. This is simply just taking some methodical steps. And what I love about your progress, Becca, is that it's like you got a taste of something Mm -hmm. and you kept riding that wave. And I talk about how that to me is one of the, the sort of not best kept secrets because it's not a secret. I I talk about it all the time, ride that wave, you know, get a taste of that energy and keep going. Because think about it this way. Imagine you're running a race, like, like physically running a race and you stop halfway in between for, let's say 10 minutes. How likely are you to get back running and finish that race? You know what I mean? We need to be consistent is, is what it comes down to. Now, granted, we can take a step forward, two steps back, But as long as we keep going, that's the key. I mean, when a baby learns to walk, that baby falls on its face a million times and it never stops. You know, when we learn to ski or snowboard, how many times do people fall on their rear end snowboarding? Uh, You get up and you go until you don't fall as much as you used to or until it's it doesn't really happen anymore. I mean, this is this is the whole point. It's about consistency, learning, growing. And yeah, when you have a hiccup, you have a hiccup. You feel what you feel, but then you just keep on going. And that I think is the one thing in particular that I've seen you do, regardless of whatever you've experienced, is that you've always put yourself out there. Even if something was hard, you had a bad day, you had a good cry, whatever it was, you you went and regrouped yourself and said, okay, if I want this, I have to do that. Mm-hmm. And I like I said I really admire you for that thank you it's not been an easy journey at all but for me I got to a point where I was just like I can't continue to feel this way anymore I need to make changes and I need to bring in new energy and the only way to bring in new energy is to give up something old that no longer serves me and it's been a journey it's not been easy but I'm seeing progress and I'm moving forward and now that I can see how far I've come already it gives me so much joy and so much strength and resilience to be able to feel like I can start to take on a lot more in my life I can take on things that I've maybe put to the side a little bit Mm -hmm. and I can face those things now and it's given me so much strength to just keep making those small steps forward and like you said I will have bad days and I will go backwards for a moment but I allow it to be a moment and I regroup I self-reflect and keep pushing forward because I'm so determined to not be that old person that I was to not feel as depressed as anxious as 
beaten down as misunderstood as I was yeah. I want to be understood so I understand myself I want to be loved so I love myself right I want to be stronger so I make myself stronger and I still have a long way to go but I am so proud of the journey that I've been on and I'm very thankful for you Kelly because you have been an integral part of my journey so far I'm I'm honored really and I it's it reminds me when I see you go through it and others go through it, it reminds me of my own journey too, because this is universal, you know, how to grow and change takes effort and time. And I, rem I remember going through the early stages and being like, whoa, will it ever get better? It does in time. It really does. If we're consistent, it does get better. Um, but we have to want it to get better and we have to be willing to accept what comes with it. This kind of leads me to um, one of my last questions. I have about two more questions for you, Becca. And this one is, how did you or how are you coping with the fact that people, when they see you in the new energy, don't always know what to do with that? And what I mean by that is, I can remember a specific point in my journey where somebody said, oh, the new Kelly. And I remember being like, excuse me, the new Kelly, I'm the same person in my heart. You just don't like that I'm not over giving and that I'm not doing the things that you want me to do, or I'm in the energy that keeps you in the same ways that you've been living. And that makes it really tricky to go about this journey because like I said earlier, friends, family, coworkers, romantic partners, this is a real struggle when we are trying to find ourselves and grow and change because we know that your new life is going to cost you your old life. And like you said, you've got to give up certain things and nobody says you have to give up those friendships or those connections that we talked about way earlier, but sometimes they just happen that way. You know, Becca, you just made a major change and cut your hair. You had very long, beautiful hair. And you said, I want to make a change in my life. And you cut your hair. You bought new glasses. You're glowing. Like, it's it's amazing, you know? And I think that people, when they see others in new energy, yes, it's a wonderful thing. It's not like they're not happy. At the same time, it can point out to others maybe where they're not making moves and it kind of threatens the friendship or the energy. And it's not like anybody makes moves to point that out to anyone. It's just that we are trying to live our best lives. Mm -hmm. And it's a very touchy subject because I think it's subconscious. I don't think anybody sits there and goes, Oh, you know, like they're like, they're meaning to, to, to have that energy, but it does come out and I've experienced it myself. How do you feel about that concept that people are going to look at you different because if you were misunderstood at one point that can also bring new misunderstanding as you shift you're not going to be mm -hmm. without misunderstand without misunderstanding or being misunderstood because once you shift it means people who once understood you won't anymore make sense mm -hmm. absolutely <clears throat> i think for me you're very right in terms of you know, I am changing and I have had my own situations where I told a friend of mine that I cut my hair and they were like, mm. oh no, you've not cut your hair. Why have you cut your hair? It was so beautiful. Right. If I'd known, I wouldn't have told you to do it. And I cut my hair and I sent them a picture and I've now seen them and they're like, oh, your hair's, your hair's really beautiful. And like your new glasses are great and you're glowing. And it's, for me, I was almost prepared at one point to be like, if this friendship isn't meant to be, then I accept it. Because if they're so comfortable, because they had said, you know, I like the old Rebecca. I, I don't know this new one as well, but I really liked the old one. And I was preparing myself in a way to be like, okay, if this friendship doesn't, continue that's okay I have 
love for you. I always will. It's no problem. Because I have the love and understanding for myself now. And I know why I cut my hair. Right. I know why I've made the choice to do it, to bring in new energy. And my old hair had remnants of my mum, the PTSD from my mum passing, my last relationship, losing my best friend. So many things were stored in that hair. Mm -hmm. And now that energy is gone. Right. I feel a new person. And if if people say oh I don't like this new Rebecca okay no problem mm-hmm. no, it it's to me now it's not a problem because I have found the most amazing friendships on this journey of people who understand me but the most important thing is I understand me now right so I feel so comfortable in the choices that I make right in terms of cutting my hair, of giving myself this new energy, that I am understanding and self-aware enough that not everyone's going to be on this journey with me. Right. But I thank you for your time that we've had together, all the great times, mm-hmm. and I wish you all the best. And I will continue to just be me because I've come so far on my journey now that I cannot go backwards. No, I wouldn't want to. No, and it's down to someone else to accept me for how I am now or not. That's not my. It's not my problem anymore. Problem ownership. Problem ownership. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Problem ownership. My mother's. My mother's famous line: "Problem ownership." You know, and there is so much truth to that. The issue with boundaries is that you know we take on everybody else's problems we take on everybody else's opinions we have too many chefs in the kitchen i mean becca there could be some people that say i like your hair this way i like your hair that way i like these glasses no i don't like those glasses i like these ones instead everybody's going to have an opinion about what we do and that's mm-hmm. fine you know everybody's entitled to their opinion but ultimately it's your mind it's your body and it's your soul and i think we have forgotten how to take ownership of ourselves you know and that leads me to the question that I've been asking everybody in these interviews and I will continue to do so because to me it's a very profound question I didn't realize the response that I would get to this question um, in general because it is deep so Becca who shuffles your cards this actually does take me quite nicely into this uh, (laughs) yeah So when I watched the first interview you did Mm -hmm. and I saw the response that was given, my initial reaction was, me, I shuffle my cards. Mm -hmm. But then I listened to the answer that was given and I could understand the viewpoint that he was coming from. Excuse me. And I then started to think about it myself. And in the same sort of way, I can kind of build on his answer. Okay. So if we kind of imagine it is a card game. Before, I had my my cards here and I was just happily going along and then the universe decided to hand me a card of my mum passing away, for example. Mm -hmm. I have no control over that. that. That's going in the cards that I hold. Right. And along with it came like depression, anxiety, uh, grief, pain, ill health in my body. And I felt like I had no control over all these things that were happening. But now, the place that I'm in for my journey, I have my cards here. And I can't change grief. I can't change anything that the universe, God, source, I can't sometimes change the cards that I'm given. But what I can change is one, how I view them, and two, the cards that I add to complement them. Mm -hmm. So now if I'm given a grief card, I could look in like this stack of cards that I've got here on the side and I could be like, okay, grief. 
I can put some understanding in there of, you know, mm-hmm. we're all souls, we're all energy and view death right. in a different way than what I did before. Right. I could add in there compassion for myself, which I didn't have before. Mm-hmm. I could add in um, good mental health because I could talk to people about my experiences. Right. You can help others. Exactly. So I can't always choose these big kind of tower moments that right. sometimes are inevitable in life. We right. can't change death. That's one thing we can't change. Mm-hmm. But we can always change our perspective on it. Right. And now where I'm at, I feel so in control that I can look at my cards. Whereas before I'd be like, I'd feel almost like, a victim of oh this is happening to me and this is so unfair but now I can look at them and go oh this is happening for me what can I learn from it right or I can look at any at my cards at any point in time and say I'm not happy with my relationship so let let me add in here uh let's do some self-healing on what happened in my last relationships yes let's add in here some compassion for myself Let's add in here some forgiveness for myself. Uh Let's add all these extra things and I can change my cards and I can be in control of things in my life to a certain extent. So I shuffle my cards. Uh I am the co-creator in my life. So Uh I can deal with the day-to-day to perhaps see bigger things that happen such as death I have no control over but it's my perspective on how I choose to view it Mm -hmm. and the cards that I choose to add into my deck to make it stronger that's within my control and my power so I go back to my original answer of I shuffle my, my cards because it's my life I am the main character and it's all about perspective so I choose to be able to reshuffle my cards as and when I want to. I love it. Beautiful answer. And you know what you made me think about was the fact that we are allowed to reshuffle. (laughs) Nobody says that we can't reshuffle or that we can't clarify. And that's me thinking from a, from a, a tarot card oracle card perspective that we can clarify cards. That's like saying, I'm going to add the compassion or the understanding, you know, we can, we can add, we co-create, we collaborate, right? We bring new ideas in new perspectives. So absolutely. And, you know, you made me think a little bit about the fact that in tarot, there are a lot of people who question reading reversals or not reading reversals. And in my mind, I don't read reversals because I don't believe that the tarot was meant to be read Um, in any other way than the way that it was laid out. And that's a personal choice by every reader. But somebody said to me recently, like, how do you see the positive in everything? Like, how do you see the positive in the tower card or the devil card or, you know, three of swords or whatever, or five of cups? To me, the reason why I don't think of the reversals, because there are cards within the tarot that are not positive. Not everything is going to be the rainbows and butterflies. There are going to be ups. There's going to be downs. That's the fool's journey of going from card zero to card 21, right? Completion of a cycle. And then the minor cards, like those two of swords or those, you know, seven of pentacles, nine of cups, whatever. Those are sort of like your daily things. And every day is a new day. So yes, you can have moments of not so great energy, but I don't have to look at everything as being upright or reversal, in my opinion, because it's all perspective. And I think that's what you were saying. It's all perspective. I mean, I can say the tower is is terrible. Sure. Nobody likes to go through a tower moment. However, it will force you, even when you don't want to acknowledge or you don't want to move forward, you don't want to do something. It will find ways to force you. And then what you do with it is completely up to you. And that's why I say knowledge is power. You can You can have all the knowledge in the world. That's great. It's powerful. But what you do with it is actually even more powerful. So 
I can see a lot of positives in a tower card. I can see a lot of positives in the devil card. Sure, it's restrictions, addictions, codependency, but I can also say, you know what, I'm going to break those chains and I'm not going to allow anything to hold me back anymore. So sometimes it's all perspective. So I, I love your I love your answer, Becca. And, you know, I thank you so much for being with me here today. Um, it's always a pleasure. And again, I, I'm so proud of you. And you really are a beacon of light. You have turned your heart light on and you've become so much more powerful. And something I just want to point out, because I didn't say it earlier, you know, Becca's wearing red today. And, you know, when I saw Becca in red uh, not that long ago, I told her, I said, that's a power color. You're wearing a powerful color. And sometimes people are afraid to wear red, you know, and uh, I have a story that I've told many times about, I had a red leather jacket <laughs> that I used to wear. And I'll never forget when a coworker said to me one day, something along the lines of, well, don't you think you look fantabulous? Or it was this sort of like snide remark because I had on a red leather jacket. I just like the jacket. It's not that I thought I was fantabulous. It's just that I... I liked this jacket. I didn't even realize that that color was evoking a message. And, you know, what we wear, the colors we wear, or, you know, the, the colors we choose in our daily life or whatever, whatever they get, even the color of your pencils, whatever it is, you know, it, it, it means something. And when we start to be open to new colors, new energy, it does change the way we glow or the way we feel. And I see you in red and I'm like, she's feeling so much more powerful than she ever has. And I'm so, so happy to see that. Thank you, Kelly. I Friday, Fridays are typically a pink day for me, but I was feeling, no, I, I'm feeling quite powerful today. So yes. the red is here, but I thank you so much for inviting me on here. And I'm, I'm so thankful for our friendship. Me too. Time. Me too, as always. Well, thank you, Becca. And thank you, everyone, for watching. It really does mean the world to me. Stay tuned because there will be more interviews coming your way. But again, thank you for allowing me to do this. So, Becca, thank you again and take care.